The Basketball Hall of Fame 60 Days of Summer is your chance to see your favorite basketball stars live and in person. Check hoophall.com for a complete list of all these exciting appearances and plan your trip today. Thank you. Oh, my God. All right, Hersley, today we're going to go to the Wayback Machine. That's where we're going to start. Okay, let's do it. All right, I want you to talk a little bit about the first time you really remember, uh, remember basketball. The first time I, what? Did you, you remember picking up a basketball? Oh, my gosh. The first time I remember picking up a basketball was, well, first of all, I, I grew up in Chicago, Illinois, sort of. Uh, all right, <laughs> go Bears and White Sox and Blackhawks. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I grew up in Chicago, so of course, just being in Chicago and growing up in the inner city, sports is a huge part of you know what you do to pass the time away. So uh, you know, basketball, football, baseball, anything, anything you can do to 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 waste time, sort of. That's what we did, and. I think, you know, basketball, I can remember sort of starting, you know, around seventh or eighth grade, sort of a late bloomer. Basketball wasn't my sport. I was more of a baseball, football guy. And, you know, a friend of mine sort of introduced me to basketball and, and yeah, seventh, eighth grade. And he was the first guy that actually he shot, he taught me how to shoot the ball because I didn't know how to shoot the ball in, in seventh and eighth grade. So he sort of tried to teach me to form and everything like that. And, you know, I guess to go on and say I became better than him. So uh, about seventh, eighth grade. So talk a little bit. You mentioned growing up in Chicago. How was life growing up in Chicago? Well, well life growing up in Chicago, it, you know, I think any inner city, you know, it, it, it could be difficult, uh, you know, because, you know, the, you, have, you have the element of dealing with, you know, with, with gangs and, and, and with, you know, drugs and I think other things that that you deal with in the inner city and you know I think what what I was blessed with is I you know I had both parents at home so they were able to keep an eye on me and, and I think there you know there's the decisions that you have to make you know when you're growing up in those kind of environment the people you hang around uh, the people you you know you select as your friends and I was lucky enough to select you know friends of mine who we're interested in the same thing that I was, which is, you know, playing sports, you know, going to school, just trying to stay out of trouble. So you said you started picking the ball up around seventh, eighth grade. You went to Westinghouse High School. You want to talk a little bit about there? I think you had a little success pretty early there. Yeah, Westinghouse High School was, uh, if you grew up in, in Chicago as far as basketball, it was, it was one of the places that you, you wanted to go if you were a basketball player. Because I can remember being in eighth grade when I was playing, when I finally, you know, started playing and was on the uh, grade school team in eighth grade. At Westinghouse, they had Mark, Mark Aguirre, who, you know, went on to, you know, play professional basketball. We had Eddie Johnson with the Westinghouse, who went on to play professional basketball. Um, I think that was uh, Teddy Grubbs. That was a, quite a few players that from Westinghouse had gone on to play successful college basketball. So I was like, okay, that's the place you want to go. And luckily enough, you know, I was good enough to play there. So at Westinghouse, did you realize what kind of talent you truly had or talent you were becoming, or did that come later in life? That came a little later in life. Uh, it's funny because I, I like to tell the story about at Westinghouse because it was such a basketball powerhouse that they had a tradition. I don't know if a lot of you know about Temple, the college, but at Westinghouse, they had a tradition of school started, classes started around eight o'clock. So we always had practice at 6.30 in the morning. So we had practice before school and, you know, of course, as well as after school. So if you played basketball, you had to be there at 6.30. And I wasn't committed. I didn't want to wake up that early in the morning at 5.30, 5 o'clock to catch the bus to get to practice. So I quit. My freshman year of high school, I was on the team, and I just quit. I'm like, I'm just not going to do it. I'm just, just too lazy. And in and, and that, that, that school year, uh, just didn't do much. 
you know, failed a grade, wasn't going anywhere. And my mom actually made me go back to my sophomore year and play. She said, either you're going to play or, you know, you're going to play a sport, but, you know, the grades you're getting and what you're doing, you got to find something that will keep you interested in school. So she made me go back my sophomore year and sort of, you know, everything turned out well from there. Well, I think there's a lot of coaches out there that probably should go thank your mom for after the <laughs> career you ended up with. Uh, so talk about a little bit now, you know, everybody who watches basketball today sees how publicized the recruiting process is. Uh, can you talk a little bit about your recruiting process when you were leaving Westinghouse, you know, trying to make the decision to go to college? You want to talk a little bit about that? Well, uh, at, of course, you know, coming from Westinghouse and the tradition that we had, you, 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 you're going to get recruited. And, but the only thing about my, about my predicament when I played at Westinghouse is I was a 6'3 center. So, and it, and it wasn't because I was the tallest guy on the team, because we, we had six, eight, we had a few six, nine guys, but it was because I can score inside. So being six, three playing center, that was, uh, you know, you, you sort of set limits on who's going to recruit you. So, you know, a lot of the North Carolinas and Dukes and all those, you know, schools didn't recruit me. But, you know, I got a lot of activity, of course, from, you know, your local, your local schools and, um, it was, you know, interesting, but I was, honestly, I was a mama's boy, so I didn't want to go far from home. I was like, I want, I want to stay close where my mom can, can get to see me play, so I chose to play at Bradley, and coincidentally, I think she went to two games in four years I played at Bradley, so she never came to see me play. <laughs> so she was always, she said, I was too nervous to come see you. So, you know, I wanted to stay close so she could see me and she never came. But, you know, it's, it's always nice being wanted going through that recruiting process, but I think you have to figure out what you want. Uh, of course, education-wise, do those schools offer those the things that you want? And, um, you know, I was, I was lucky enough where I was able to get a good education, play for, a good coach at Bradley and, you know, be close to home. Was there ever a point in that recruiting process where you were ever on the fence, where you were ever 50-50 with another institution, or was it always Bradley? Well, it, it actually, it, it came down to Bradley and Illinois State, and they both played in the same conference. So it was, um, you know, and both were, you know, they were 45 minutes separated the two schools. And I think the only, the only reason I chose Bradley was, was because the, the coach at Bradley, he actually came to our practice and, and our coach in high school played me at the guard position. And he was like, okay, yeah, he can play guard. So we're gonna bring him in and he'll play guard with us. And the Illinois State coach who was Bob Donawal at the time, I thought he was crazy. And I was like, I just can't go play for that guy. So that was, you know, so that was the decision as well. So anybody who's ever researched uh, Hersey and any of his statistics, I'm not going to go over all of them for you because uh, it's certainly pretty impressive. Um, but you go to Bradley and have arguably one of the greatest collegiate careers anyone to ever play college basketball. Uh, can you talk a little bit about just kind of the dominant run you had in college and your ability to score and kind of how your game evolved a little bit throughout your time there? Uh, well, well, first of all, going, I think going to college as a, as a, as a freshman, you know, and luckily at Brad, we had eight freshmen to come in to Bradley that year. So it was, you know, it was, it was pretty cool to come in with that many young players, but, um, and playing center in, in high school, you know, never really having the opportunity to shoot the three or shoot the outside shot. Um, I had to work a lot on my jump shot. So I, I can remember, you know, sort of every day going to the, to the gym and putting up 500 shots, you know, just putting up 500 shots to, to, to make sure that, you know, I was showing the coach that I was dedicated, that I was going to work on my game, that I was going to work on my perimeter game. And, and luckily enough, I was able to, to start my freshman year. But being a freshman, you're playing with over the, over the class, I mean, you're playing with upper class, I mean, you, you, you don't want to step on any toes, so you're, you're a little nervous, you're a little shy, you don't want to put up as many shots. And I can remember my, my coach, Dick Versace, at the time, uh, we used to run this little offense, and, and he told me, he actually told me one day, he said, when the ball comes to you in this corner, he said, you shoot it every time. And I'm like, 
what do you mean? He's like, well, if, you, if you touch the ball in the corner, he said, you shoot it every time. If you don't, I'm going to sit you down. And I was like, okay. I guess that's motivation enough to shoot the basketball. So uh, that sort of started me shooting, and from that point, I never stopped. So let's talk about a little bit about that. Let's talk about that 87-88 season. I mean, you averaged 36 points a game, uh, led the NCAA in scoring, one of the greatest collegiate seasons arguably ever. Just talk about what that season was like and, and that run and your shooting percentage, and just talk about how the ball just continuously went in for you that year. Uh, it, it was it was, of course, you know, when you're scoring 36 points a game, it's, it's fun, you know, it's enjoyable. And the crazy thing about it is, you know, there were nights where, you know, if I, if I scored 30, it was like, it was an off night. And people were like, what happened to you tonight? I'm like, I, I, you know, I scored 30, I'm okay. Like, I'll, I'll score 42 next game, so it'll be all right. But, you know, it was, I, at that time, my senior year, um, and this was coming off, my junior year when I averaged 27 points per game. But uh, to, to make, I guess, to make a long story short, I had Dick Versace my first two years of college. He was my first, my college coach. And, you know, had some great success playing under Dick Versace. Then Stan Allback came in my junior and senior year and Stan Allback had just been let go by the Chicago Bulls. And he, and he had Michael Jordan in Chicago. So when he came in, he said, okay, what we're gonna do is we're gonna run the same offense, the same pro-type offense that I ran for Michael. He said, except you're gonna be our guy. He's like, we're gonna run this offense around you so you're gonna get lots of shots. And I was like, okay. that." That sounds good. So I averaged 27 my junior year, then 36 my senior year, running this pro-style offense that, you know, everything was, was centered around, you know, us getting up and down the court as quickly as we possibly can, getting up a shot. And then if not, if we couldn't get a quick shot, then, you know, just me running off a lot of screens and, and posting up a little. And, you know, the, I was the focal point of the, of the offense. And my teammates accepted it. You know, they got me the ball. and. You know, it was a lot of fun. Um, you're clearly a modest guy, so I'm going to go out on a limb and not be modest for you here. Um, you ended your collegiate career in 1988, which I'm not trying to date you by any means, but I think that was 27 <laughs> years ago, if my math is correct. Oh, my gosh. Um, yeah. You're still in the record books to this day as the eighth all-time leading collegiate scorer. You've scored over 3,000 points in your collegiate career ahead of, just think of these names, ahead of the Big O, ahead of Danny Manning, ahead of Elvin Hayes, ahead of Larry Bird, guys who all had tremendous collegiate careers. Can you think of that for a minute and kind of reflect on looking back now 27 years later, what that really means for you? Uh, you know, it, it means a lot, you know, and, you know, I, I think to be in, a, in that type of, you know, category where, you know, of course, 3,000 points in, in college, you know, is rarely reach these days, especially with guys, you know, leaving early. But, um, you know, it was, it, it was an honor to, you know, of course, to represent Bradley and, and, to, and to go out there and play. But, you know, when you mention some of the guys that I'm ahead of, you know, it's like, I, you know, these guys went on <laughs> to have, you know, great pro careers. You know, I, you know, not to say that I didn't have a good one because I did, but, you know, it's, it's, it's humbling to think that, that you know you can you can play this sport and and still and, and have numbers that are better than some of those guys. So I I really try not <laughs> to think about it much. As I said, he's being honest, but I'm not modest. But I'm not going to be for him. Make sure you guys go look, check out some of the stats, and look at that list of who he's head of. It's it's uh, absolutely remarkable. So you leave college prior to the NBA draft. You had an experience that probably most would dream about. You got a chance to play for a country in Seoul. You want to talk a little bit about that experience? Yeah, I had a chance to represent the USA and play in the Olympics in the 88 Olympics in Seoul, Korea. Um, and, you know, of course, there's, there's nothing more special than, than putting on that USA jersey and representing your country. Um, and just the whole entire Olympic experience is something that, you know, that you'll, that you'll never forget just the opportunity of course to represent your country but to interact with 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 uh other sports you know other people from different country uh you know to make friends and 
and to socialize with them. And, you know, and unfortunately, the, the only thing about that Olympics is, uh, you know, we, we lost, so I was on the last college team to ever play in the Olympics, but still a great experience. John Thompson uh, was our coach, did a wonderful job. And, you know, I think probably the only time I actually got injured during the Olympics and, you know, sort of my only injury ever. <laughs> it was like, what, what a time to get injured. So was the, was the competition, was the style of play any different in that format than it was collegiately for you or was it pretty similar? Well, it was pretty similar. I, I think you just had, had to get used to the international play of, you know, being able to hit the ball off the rim, or, you know, sometimes taking a ball on the, out on the sideline, the referee not having to touch the ball so you can just grab it and go, you know, just, just little changes. But I think style of play was, was, was pretty similar, uh, you know, zone, the three-point shot was in. So, um, you know, it, it, was, it, was, it was just a, w a wonderful time. Um, you know, a lot of, uh, not a lot of, I think most of the guys that were, on that, that were on that team, Olympic team, you know, still in contact with today just because of the experience that we went through. So you score 36 points a game as a senior. You play for your country. Next big moment coming up for you is the NBA draft. Leading up to that, did you know where you were going? Did you have a sense or what was that process like? Uh, well, it's a little different than today's guys coming into the draft. Um, you know, I, I knew I was going to be a lottery pick. So, you know, a lottery pick, um, you know, I was going to go in the top, whatever, 10. Uh, so there was only uh, so many teams that I had to go around and visit. You know, they want to interview you. They want to see what kind of person you are. They want, they want you to take these psychological tests to see, you know, if you're, uh, I guess, if you're, I, I don't know, I don't know what the purpose of the psychological tests are, but, you know, so you have to do all that. And, but the, the interesting thing about the draft is by draft day, I knew because Philadelphia, who was picking number three that year, uh, had told us that, okay, we're going to pick Hersey at number three. So I'm like, okay, you know, I'm in New York with the draft and with my family and the number three pick comes and and Philadelphia picks Charles Smith. <laughs> so I'm like, okay, what happened? <laughs> so I'm just sitting there and they, they, didn't, they neglected to tell me that, that that morning they had worked out a draft day trade. So I was picked number six by the Clippers. Then they swapped players and a couple of players. So I still ended up with Philadelphia, but it was really nerve-wracking sitting there when you're thinking you're going to Philadelphia, then you end up in, you know, end up being drafted by the Clippers. And, you know, just another little quick story how things have changed so much. You know, during, back then during the draft, you know, there were no handlers and there were no, you know, agents and people there to, to direct you and everything. So I'm drafted by Philadelphia. Uh, drafted by the Clippers, they announced the trade, and I get a call from Philadelphia say, okay, we want you to jump on the train, go outside New York, jump on the train, catch a train to Philly, somebody be there to pick you up at the train station, uh, we have a press conference. Cool, you know, no problem, you know, I go out, get on the train, I'm heading to Philadelphia, and the next thing you know, I'm in Delaware. <laughs> I, I, so I missed the stop, and I'm like, oh crap, where am I at now? So, you know, I'm coming out of college and I'm, I'm with my fiance and we're like, actually she was my wife at the time. We had gotten married over the summer. So I'm like, where am I? <laughs> so we actually, it was a crazy story. We have to get off the train, jump, jump on another train, head back to Philly, but let alone to say, you know, those things don't happen these days. <laughs> So the question, did you make the press conference in time? That's the real question. No, everyone waited. Everyone had to wait another hour and a half until I got on another train and backtracked and got to Philadelphia. So you make the press conference, and the next chapter of your life starts. You go to the Sixers, and you get paired with Chuck, Charles Barkley. Talk a little bit about what it meant playing with him, scoring side by side with him. I mean, you guys were kind of the one-two punch there on a, on a pretty solid team, for those of you that don't remember. Talk a little bit about that, if you could. Yeah, Charles was interesting you know uh you know a, a really a dear friend of mine still 
today, you know, when, when we see each other, we always have a great time. And, you know, of course, when we're in the same cities, we do dinner and everything. So, you know, I, I, I love him to death. And, and I owe a lot of my success, I think, in the NBA to Charles. Um, you know, Charles was, a, was, the, was the kind of player that, you know, he, he just exuded confidence. You know, he knew he was a good player, and, and he demonstrated that every night. And, I, you know, there are a couple of, you know, true story is, you know, we're playing against the, uh, we're playing against the Detroit Pistons, and, you know, they have Isaiah and Joe Dumars, and this is when Dennis Rodman was on the Pistons as well. And, you know, they have Bill Lambeer, and I just, oh, I have an awful first half. I feel like I'm scoreless. I have zero points. I'm all seven from the field, and I'm just playing awful. And coming out the second half, Charles Liddy grabs me by my collar, by my jersey, and grabs me sort of close to him, and then, you know, I can't say exactly what he says, but it's more like, you know, get your crap together, you know, you're too good to be, you know, scoring zero points and, you know, out there playing like, you know, so I'm like, holy crap, you know, what, what's going on? And, you know, that alone to say, you know, I had a, a great second half, but, you know, but he, he had faith in me and the confidence that, you know, he knew he was the number one player on the team and he was like, you know, you're number two, you know, I need you to, to go out there and, and score and be my number two. And, and he made sure every night that I, was, that I was prepared and ready to play. So I owe a lot to Charles. Is there a rated PG story of a goofy Charles that you can, uh, that you can tell everybody? <laughs> rated PG story. I don't know. I don't, but a lot of them probably have heard Charles a little. So there's probably not many PG stories that you could, that, that you could tell about Charles. But... You know, I, I think the most interesting thing about Charles is, is that I tell people all the time that they find it hard to believe that as, as dominant as a player as Charles was, and, and, you know, and trust me, he could do whatever he wanted to on the court, never practiced. Charles hardly ever practiced. And, and it was, I was amazed at how he was able to, to do the things he did, you know, when you don't practice, because, you know, you're always taught growing up, you know, you practice, you practice, you practice, you get out there, and you drill, and you do everything that you can to, to be a better player. And, but he was one of those unique guys that, that just had all the gifts. And, you know, it was, a, it was just a lot of fun being around him. So you come in as a rookie, you score 15, a little over 15 points a game. You played an era where the best of the best that I ever played. I mean, you, you dominate your senior year, you score 36 points. You come into the NBA, you score 15 points per game, which is incredibly impressive. How did your game translate so well from college to the professional game? Uh, I think, of course, playing with, playing with for Stan all back and him coming from Chicago and, and having Michael Jordan and running a pro-type system in college helped and, and then just you know playing with Charles and and you know being able to pick up points from him and you know he was very smart about you know he was a great offensive player so he knew little things that 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 can help me out and he pointed those things out and and you know just the fact that being able to shoot the ball from the perimeter you know Charles demanded a lot of double teams you know that was I was able to get you know get up a lot of threes uh you know I had the fortune of playing with Maurice Cheeks my um my rookie year who also you know I think is uh you know one of the one of the best point guards to ever play in the NBA so um you know just those two guys really just helped me out a lot and helped that transition uh, I mean, throughout your career, you were obviously a well-documented scorer. But following your rookie year, your next four years, you don't average less than 18 a game. I mean, there's not many folks in the history of the league that can say their scoring average was that high for that many years in a row. Talk about that, that scoring stretch as a professional and looking back at that, what meant to you now? Uh, you know, it was all pretty much all confidence, knowing that, um, that, you know, once you've made and sort of figured out your niche that... Uh, you know, you can go out there every night and do it, no matter who you were, who you were playing against. And, you know, that's, that's the mentality I think you have to take as a, as a scorer in the NBA, that, you know, no matter who you're, 
who's guarding you on that particular night? You know, it's your job to go out there and get your 20 points. And, you know, of course, you're going to be playing against, you know, Michael Jordan one night, who you know that, you know, one of the best defensive players to ever play this game. And that, okay, if you get 20, it, it's going to be tough because, you know, not only is he, you know, great defensively, but then you got to guard him on the other end. So it's, it's, it's just a mentality putting in the time um, and, and just, just going out there and playing. I mean, there's no question in your time with Philly, you're one of the most beloved by fans, beloved by your teammates. Uh, a lot of people don't understand what the NBA and the true business side of the NBA is. Uh, we don't need to touch on it in great detail, but can you talk a little bit about what it's like you know, making a home in a city, getting traded, playing for one team, playing for another team. Can you kind of give the audience a little bit of an insight what that, what the business side of that is really like? Uh, it's, it's difficult. You know, you, you learn that, you know, the, that the game is a business pretty quickly. And, you know, I think by the first, by the first time I was traded, you know, this is after, you know, five years in a city, you know, developing, uh, you know, great friends, uh, getting familiar with the city, uh, you know, finding a good church. You know, you just, you just implemented yourself in the, in, in the entire city. Then all of a sudden, to get that call one day that, hey, you traded to Charlotte, you know, and then, you know, have to go home and, and tell your wife, okay, we got to go now and, and get used to a, a new city and find new friends. Um, it's it, it's difficult, you know, and, and it's probably more difficult, you know, on the family and on the kids than it is on on me as a basketball player because the one thing I have that they didn't have was I know that once I get into another city, I'm going to play basketball, that I'm going to be around, you know, other guys, I'm going to have friends, I'm going to have things to do, whereas, you know, your wife or your kids, they all of a sudden have to get back used to, to another city and they have to find new friends and they have to go out, out of their way to, to make sure that they're comfortable in a city where all of those things are built in for me because of what I do for my job. So it, it's definitely more difficult on them than, than it is me. So, but very hard experience. So I mentioned at the start of the program, we we're going to allow you the opportunity to ask Hersey a few questions. So uh, in a moment, one of our staff members is going to come around. So if you have a question for Hersey, just please raise your hand and the staff member will come get you. We're going to ask a few more questions prior to that, but please get your hands up. And if you have a question, we'll be allowed to ask Hersey that in just a moment. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about uh, if you want to pick two or three uh, opponents that you played with throughout your career, either professionally or in college, what were some of the tougher opponents and why were they so difficult? Well. First of all, I think everybody would probably guess, you know, during, during my years, I played pretty much, you know, against Michael Jordan four or five times a year. We were in the Eastern Conference together. So he was by far the, the most difficult guy that, I, that I've ever had to guard and, you know, probably had to score against as well, just, you know, because of his athleticism. And, you know, a lot of people saw that, but I think the one thing, you know, that always impressed me with Michael was that he was, he was so fundamentally sound that, you know, footwork, everything that he did, it, you know, it was, it, was, it was almost perfect. And, and then he had that killer instinct. You know, there were not many guys that, you know, had the mentality that he did. So Michael would always be number one. And, and I had the chance of, you know, playing against Magic Johnson. You know, and I had to guard Magic. And Magic was just difficult for totally different reasons because, you know, he was a 6'9 point guard. And, you know, at that time, it's like, how do you guard somebody 6'9 as quick as he is and handles the ball the way he does, you know, can post up, can pass, you know, the way he did. So Magic, I would say, you know, was always number two. And then, you know, I sort of go back and forth between, you know, Reggie Miller and Mitch Richmond. You know, those guys, because of different reasons, you know, Mitch, Reggie Miller was just probably the best shooter I've ever played against. Uh, Mark Price is in that category as well. But Reggie Miller, just, you know, his constant movement, he was one of those guys that just kept coming off screens. You had to be in great shape to guard him. And, you know, so him and then just Mitch Richmond, because he can do everything, post, shoot, handle it, very strong player. Uh, I always thought one of the most underrated uh, two guards in the league because uh, he, he, was, he was something to try to handle. 
Who was the biggest trash talker you ever played against? <laughs> the biggest trash talk I ever played against. Or played with. Uh, well, I, I, Charles can give it to people occasionally. Uh, I, pl I played with Gary Payton, who was, uh, you know, a big trash talker. But, you know, Gary was one of those guys that if you, you know, he didn't talk trash if you didn't, t if you didn't start with him. Once you started talking to him, then, you know, there was no stopping him. Then, you know, he would, he would go on and on and on. Um, you know, I've, you know, people, people say Larry Bird was a big trash talker, but, you know, I've, I've never experienced that. I think Larry Bird, you know, because one, one of the stories I have about him was, you know, coming into the league, you know, we both played in the same conference, the Missouri Valley Conference, and, you know, my first game against him, he sort of walked up to me and, like, welcome to the league, hope you have a great career. And I'm like, okay, thank you. You know, I, I, didn't, I, didn't, I didn't know, I didn't really quite know how to take that. You know, and uh, it's funny, because back in those days, I think a lot of the guys did that. I can remember Michael Jordan doing that, and, and Clyde Drexler coming up to me and saying, you know, welcome, you know. And so, uh, you know, that was, you know, reaffirming. Those guys were pretty nice, but I was wondering also, were they trying to play mind games with me? Um, we'll put uh, we'll put Charles aside in this one, but can you list two or three of your your teammates that were really influential to you, or some of your more favorite or most fun teammates to play with? Uh, some of my favorite. Oh, and I've had some really. I, I've had some great teammates over the years, um, and I think uh, you know Johnny Dawkins was a was a. He's coaching Stanford now out of Duke. He was a huge influence on me because I think sort of he sort of helped change, you know, my work ethic uh, in the pros because he was traded to Philly for more. He came in after Maurice Cheeks. And, and you know, in Philly, we used to have practice at 11 o'clock uh, every day. But Johnny was such a worker, and both of us played the backcourt together that every morning, you know, he was like, let's get, we got to get to the gym at 930. So we were at the gym every day at 9.30. You know, we practice at 11, so we get our shots up, our drills, whatever we were working on. And then after it was over, you know, practice from 11 to 1, we always stayed an hour afterwards, just then going over things that we went in practice and getting up more shots. So he had a huge influence on me, I think, just work ethic-wise and, you know, being able to realize the time you have to put in to be successful. Um, I'm, you know, Rick Mahorn, you know, I can remember playing with, with Rick Mahorn, you know, funny guy, just a great influence, brought out, you know, toughness in, in me, I think, that I, you know, didn't think I had. Um, then moving on to Charlotte and playing with uh, Larry Johnson and Alonzo Mourning, you know, just two Warriors guys that went out there every night. You learn different things from them. Uh, then, of course, you know, being in Seattle, you know, Detlef Shrimp is one of my all-time great teammates uh, playing with Gary and Sean Kemp. Uh, you know, you just learn little, little things from all these great guys that you, that you encounter as, you, as your, your career goes on. What about on the, the coaching ranks? What, uh, what one coach was most influential for you? Uh, well, I think, I think as a player, uh, you know, my first coach, Jimmy Lynham, I had in Philadelphia, was, was a huge influence on me. Um, just because you, as, as a rookie, you're looking for validation. You're looking for someone to, to really let you know that, that you can make it in the, in the NBA. And, and he was a very positive role model on just, on, on just the talks. And, you know, when you're playing bad and when you're going through one of those slumps at, at you know, keeping you, keeping you up and, you know, sitting down, watching film with you. Okay, this is what you did. This is what you did wrong. This is what you have to do better at, you know. so. Jimmy Lynham was big, and then, and then George Carl. I, I enjoy playing for George Carl in Seattle. Um, you know, there's just a player's coach. Um, you know, allowed you the freedom to, to, to make mistakes, but, you know, not punish you for making those mistakes. And, and, and also just as a coach that just cared for his players and, and that really went out of his way to show them that, that they were more than players. Okay, we're going to start taking a few questions from the audience now. So if you want to come on up, just say your name and ask your question for Hersey. Hey, hey, I'm 
Gavin. I'm from South Carolina, and my question is, uh, you talked a little bit about the business side of basketball and being traded, and can you talk about what it was like when you uh, were traded to Chicago your home, and got to play for your hometown Bulls in the 99-2000 season? Oh, okay. Yeah, I was uh, sort of at the tail end of my career. I was, was traded to Chicago, you know, where I was born and raised, and and, and honestly, you know, it's it's a it's a dream, you know. It's a it's an honor to go back home and play, you know, f in front of your friends, in front of your family, uh, you know. And you know, of course, I was always a Bulls fan growing up. So even when I was in the NBA, you know, if if we didn't win it, like okay, I want Chicago to win it, you know, because they're still my team. The only problem with you know with playing in Chicago is that you have friends. <laughs> And you have family, and then all of a sudden, everybody wants tickets, and you know. So you know, I, you know, I think I played there in what, ninety nine, two thousand. You know, I graduated high school in eighty eight. I actually had teachers calling me that I had not talked to in twenty years since I graduated grade school and in high school, calling asking for tickets, and. I'm like, you know, there's only so many I get. I can't, you know, just uh, uh, please everyone. So just, you know, it's great playing there, but it's a different distraction with, you know, family members and, and friends and, and you know, with, with dealing with those kind of things. But other than that, you know, I had a wonderful time. Great, great question. Thank you. Thank you. Next. Mr. Hawkins, my name is Kevin O'Sullivan. I'm a, a baseball coach in Palm Harbor, Florida. I was uh, I lived in Chicago for 10 years. Um, two quick questions. One uh, might be, I don't know if it was around your time, did you ever get a chance to play with or against Benji Wilson? I know I never played. It was definitely around my time, but I never played with him and never got, had the opportunity to play against him, but saw him play. And what was your, you know, he was the thing. What was your opinion? Could he have been, was he NBA material? He was definitely NBA material. And I, and I think at that time, you know, a lot of people were comparing him to maybe Magic. You know, someone that can come in and, and, and really, you know, sort of like he did, revolutionize that position. A guy that can, at that particular size, can handle the ball, can, can shoot it. Uh, just had a, a winning instinct, and you know, of course, you know that tragedy took a, took that away from us. But yeah, I think he could have been something special uh, just from watching him in high school. Real, I, I'm sorry, I just taking too much time. I just, without ruining any friendships, um, top three guys that uh, you'd stay away from at nighttime. Top three guys I would stay away from at nighttime. <laughs> <laughs> well, Charles was one of them. <laughs> really, I definitely, you know, as, as, as great of friends as we are, yeah, I try not to stay with him too much at night. Not good for the marriage, you know, to hang with Charles. <laughs> uh, let me see. I, let me see, who else would I put it? You're gonna, I'm going to have to think about two other guys because I was never really a guy that went out that much anyway so you know if we had players teammates that went out that was just you know that was their thing um you know i know gary liked to go out you know gary payton was a you know a guy that liked to go out but you know i other than that i really don't know because i you know that just really wasn't my scene all right thank you next question please I'm Susan. I'm from Boston. Do you still play? Uh, Susan, I do not play. Do you admit it? I do not. Do you it's, it, play? It's, it's, well, I actually, it's funny because when I retired in 2001, uh, I had just decided I was done and that I wasn't going to play any more basketball. And I didn't touch a ball or didn't shoot a ball after I retired in 2001 for probably four years. I just, you know, I had just had enough and was like, okay. And, and plus, you know, my, I had three boys, so they were at the age where I think I needed to concentrate a little more on them and, and, and 
helping my wife then raise them. So that was sort of became my priority. And, um, and no, so I, I did not miss it. You know, I had an opportunity to coach them in high school. Oh, did you uh, do that? Yes. So I had a chance to coach my boys in high school, which, which was fun. But I think you sort of learn quickly as coach and dad, when to be coach and when to be dad. And at home, you can't be coach, <laughs> you know, because they're looking at you different. So, so yeah. It, and, um, are they still playing? I have one that's, uh, two that are still playing. One that was actually, unfortunately, he's had a rough summer. He was actually draft eligible this year and had a chance to go possibly get drafted, but he got injured. So he's, he's got injured the entire summer. So he'll, he's decided not to go overseas and play. He's just going to do the D-League this year and, and, and hopefully see how that turns out. Great questions. Thank you. Thank you. Next, please. I'm Kieran. I'm from California. I have two questions. And what would be the big the closest comparison to, between you and a modern NBA player playing today? Oh my gosh. Uh, a mo uh, I don't know, I'm trying to think who would... Uh, the, the kid in Washington. What's the, the two guard in Washington? Who is it? Bradley Beal, yes, I would possibly... Thank you for that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I would probably say Bradley Beal, a guy that can shoot it, uh, you know, can put it down a little, but just pretty smooth coming off screens, you know, and, 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 and being able to knock down shots. So I would, I would say him. Great, great question. Thank you. Well, he had a two-part question. Um, what would be your dream big three? My dream big three? Ooh, wow. Well... Of course, uh, you know, because I played against Jordan, I would have to put Jordan on that, on that list. Uh, I mean, am I playing with them, or is this just three guys I get to pick? You're playing with them. Oh, I'm playing, so it's three other guys. Yeah, uh, two other guys. Two other guys. Oh, I'm part of the three. Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, you know what? Oh my gosh, that's a tough one. But what two guys that really came, my first two guys came to mind was Jordan and Larry Bird. Those are the first two guys came to mind. So I'm, I'm gonna go with those two. Great, thank you, great question. Next, please. Hi, I'm Virginia Nelson from Seattle. And I was wondering, what did you like most about um, basketball? Uh, what I like most about basketball was, you know, the fact that you get to do something that you love doing, uh, which, you know, doesn't seem like a job when you get to play basketball for a living. And the money. You make a, you make a pretty good living playing basketball. So those are the two things I enjoyed most. Good question. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Next question. Hi, I'm Louise. I'm also from Seattle. Um, I was just wondering, um, in high school and college, what encouraged you to keep um, playing basketball and growing as a basketball player? Uh, what well, my, my mom sort of making me go back, and I think, you know, my, just my parents' influence. And um, then I think just the coaches that I had over over the years from high school to college. Uh, and, you know, those guys, you know, you spend a lot of time with, and they, they have an influence over you. So just the positive reinforcement, just the fact that, you know, they saw something in me that they thought I could play at the next level and continue, and, you know, and can continue to play, um, you know, carried a, a lot of weight. So when, you're, when your high school coach says, you know, you're talented enough to play college, you know, but, you know, you, you got to put the time in. You got to do these things. And when your college coach says, you know, I think you can make the NBA, you know, but, you know, you got to do these few things. That, so I think just those, those two guys. But good question. 
Thank you. And one final question, please. Hi, I'm Jesse, and I'm from New York. If you had the chance to play a one-on-one -on -one with anyone that's in the NBA now, who would it be and why? One-on-one -on -one with anyone right now, uh, it would have to be LeBron. I, he would probably destroy me, but you know, just you know, just the opportunity to to play against him. I missed playing against you know him, but you know, I, I just being around the NBA now, I get to see him and you know talk to him occasionally and whatever. And I, I think it would have been just uh, tremendous to, to have an opportunity to play against him. Great, great question. Thank you. One more quick one. We can do one more, come on. Hi, I'm Darren, I'm from Michigan. And I was wondering, um, who was your favorite player growing up? My favorite player was uh, Dr. J. I, you know, en enjoyed uh, watching him. And it was, coincidentally, you know, it's crazy that I was drafted by Philly who, you know, he had just retired a couple of years before that. But, you know, I, you know, no one ever played the game like Dr. J and just watching him was incredible. But I was also impressed with, you know, just how he handled himself off the court. You know, he was a gentleman, uh, just a guy that represented the NBA uh, as best as it can possibly be represented. And, you know, just a little, side note to that, you know, having Dr. J as my favorite guy. I can remember being drafted by Philadelphia and then my wife and I sitting in our home uh, probably about a couple of months after, you know, being there and the phone rings and I'm like, let's call her. She picks it up and, 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 she's, and she says, um, Dr. J is on the phone. And I'm like, who? She's like, Dr. J. So uh, I pick it up, it's like, hey, this, this is Julius, and I'd like to have you come over to the house for dinner and stuff. And, and I'm like, holy crap. <laughs> you know, I hadn't met him at that point. You know, I'd been in Philly for two weeks, and he sort of, sort of reached out to me and welcomed me to the city and had us over for dinner and, you know, made his family a thing. So, you know, what an honor that was. But Dr. J, is you? good. Thank you. Good question. Good question, bud. Thank you. All right, Hershey, as we sit here and as you look up, you look up at the honors ring and you see many past teammates, many past uh, players you played against, coaches you played for, coaches you played against. I mean, can you reflect for a minute what it means for you today to kind of be here at the Hall of Fame, speaking to our guests and kind of being inside the building with, along with yourself, some of the other greats of the games? Uh, it's humbling. It's a, you know, it's a tremendous honor to be here. I, I've never been to the Basketball Hall of Fame. So just to have the opportunity to come here and, you know, and, and of course to, to walk around and then to look up and to see somebody, like you said, to see some of these names and, and, you know, players I've played against and guys that I know personally. And of course, everybody is so deserving to, to be in the Hall of Fame. Uh, it's, you know, it's, it, it, it's, it's, it's humbling to be here and, you know, to be where basketball was invented. and. And, you know, just to know that this game, which has been so great to me, you know, that, you know, there are still, you know, I see a lot of kids here that, you know, their dreams and their hopes is, you know, uh, one day to, to play in the NBA. And, you know, hopefully, you know, that, could, that can come true and they can have their, you know, name up here one day. So, uh, you know, it's an honor. Percy Hawkins, it was truly a pleasure for you participating in the program today. Ladies and gentlemen, if we could please give a warm Hall of Fame round of applause to Thank Percy you. Hawkins.